everybody back to class uh, so today i'm going to discuss about some of these uh, popular neural network so today i'm going to discuss about some of the popular uh, neural network architectures so essentially you might have heard of uh, something called as uh, vgg net or dense net trace net google nets etc so we are basically going to look into the architecture now this part is going to look into only the model space of the problem which is essentially uh, what does the whole architecture constitute of okay now following this wednesday uh, today i will be introducing you to some part of compute complexity as well which uh, essentially is in the last class we had done a part on uh, estimating model complexity which is the total number of weights now and i had shown you how to calculate that for fully connected layers and how to calculate that for uh, convolutional connections over there but we had not done the whole uh, estimation for a complete model that's something which we had not done now there is another part which comes down which is called as the compute complexity in the forward pass or just during inference what will be the total amount of compute operations needed so there will be some additions there will be some multiplications or there can be some comparison and search kind of an operation as well now each of them is going to cost some uh, unit cycles on the compute platform itself and that's going to guide essentially how fast will be a processing through your uh, model so that's essentially what we call as throughput so starting from here uh, i will get you introduced on to some of the throughputs for some of these but uh, we are not going to calculate them and on wednesday we do that through a worksheet itself so one of these first ones is is what is called as alex net and in fact uh, this network can more or less be said as that one which led to the initial breakthrough so uh, the whole point of alex net was uh, Uh, this was in in 2012 in Europe, and for the first time, this paper had shown that uh, you can actually use a deep neural network in order to uh, solve an ImageNet class of problem. And none before this had actually demonstrated a uh, efficacy that deep neural networks could beat all the classical approaches which were available as such for solving uh, the ImageNet classification problem itself. Okay, now. what this consisted of is what is shown in this architecture now it it it's a bit of clumsy and uh, looks a bit nested now the reason for that being is uh, at that point of time the amount of uh, memory available in gpus was not enough to have the whole network defined in one shot so what they had decided to define it was uh, they would break it down into two different parts and uh, for each part they would be uh, Uh, computing it separately so essentially the whole network was uh, broken into two parallel slices and it was computed in parallel slices itself so here what comes on is your initial image is the same as that 224 cross 224 the the standard image net resolution and uh, you start with an image net resolution and then you convolve with the first layer which is an 11 cross 11 layer okay now uh, over here this this first convolution will be of 11 cross 11 now from there you go on and you are able to generate 96 such layers which are basically sliced in 48 and 48 combinations so what they do is that uh, you need to have 96 such convolution kernels each of 11 cross 11 in size now instead of it in one shot which was hard for it to compute and store it on memory they had broken it down into two uh, say batteries parallel batteries of 48 and 48 convolutions says that you will get down the same output over here now from here you keep on doing in this parallel form itself so from 48 you go to 128 from this 48 you go to another 128 so in the next layer from 96 you are at 256 from 128 you go to 192 from this 128 you go to 192 so in this layer you are from 256 to 384 then again to 384 then again to 256 and eventually here what you are going to get is that you are going to have a linearization and a dense connectivity to 2048 and 2048 which will make 4096 neurons then 4096 neurons and then you go down to 1000 neurons over there okay now this is how originally it was implemented over there but today since we don't have that restriction of memory in any way so how we choose to do is you don't have any more these parallel batteries of 48 and 48 convolutions we basically take 96 convolution kernels over here 256 in the subsequent ones then uh, 384 over here 384 over here then 256 4096 4096 and then then on the output of 1000 neurons itself okay 
Now here, if you come from there onto this kind of a visualization, which essentially looks into the first layer of uh, the AlexNet. Now you have this particular layer over here. So what we chose is that there are 96 kernels, each of size 11 cross 11. And my input is a three channel tensor because that's an RGB image. So essentially this convolution kernel over here is also a RGB um, appearing kernel itself. Now there will be 96 of them and that's what is, is visualized over here. Now it was interestingly found out that uh, the reason why it was working that great was uh, one part is where it was learning all the classical kind of edge detectors uh, using second order derivatives. But then beyond that it was also learning uh, some of these kind of color gradients as well. So you can have gradients in terms of the color, how it shows up. So that is also something which this one learns up and, and that's what was making these ones. So while on the top what you see is those classical features which typically any kind of a, uh, uh, say say a visual computing uh, pipeline would have learned. But beyond that you are also able to learn something which is related to the color itself. And these color features are something which makes it really good. So that was one of these first discoveries of how were these networks really that powerful so as to go and uh, solve ImageNet class of problems. Okay. Now, uh, if you look over here, there are few of them, say, say in this, uh, this one is one, two, three, four, fifth. The fifth row and the third column over here, as well as if you go along this fifth row and then this is third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So fifth row, sixth column. So fifth row, third column, fifth row, sixth column. If you look at it, they, they look like uh, those chessboard patterns over there, a checkerboard matrix pattern over there. Now these checkerboard matrix patterns typically have a very interesting uh, way, uh, like how they would behave. So can you, can you, uh, can you start like somewhat uh, thinking onto what, when uh, would these two kind of kernels give a very high response? What should be present in the image for which they would be giving a very high response? Zebra, but a zebra can also give you high response for these ones, right? Something where only these checkerboards will be giving you the highest response, but others will not give you that high response. They would give you a response, but not as high as what a chessboard would give you. Okay, so um, have you heard of something called as a autocorrelation? Signals and systems, everybody has heard about autocorrelation. Now what is an autocorrelation? How do you define that? No, no, mathematically what is autocorrelation? Yes, so essentially if you convolve it, not convolution but it has to be correlation. So if the same signal or the same pattern is correlated by itself, then it's going to give you the highest response, okay. And, and uh, that, that highest response is guided by the autocorrelation function itself. So essentially, if I convolve this uh, chessboard pattern with itself, then I'm going to get the highest response. That is what will come down. Now, now on an image, if you have any regions which have these kind of chessboard patterns, that's the one where you will get down these high responses coming down. Okay, now where will you have these kind of small chessboard patterns? Where all do you think you will have small chessboard like patterns? One is if there is a chess, there is a chess board. Beyond that where? Now the reason why I said zebras will give you more responses over here is because they are stripes. So similarly if there is a leopard also there, there are stripes over there. So essentially that's the reason why you will get high responses around these other kernels. Yes, pixelated ones will also give you high responses. Very good. Then. So your friend is wearing a shirt, that shirt will also give a very high response because that has a chessboard pattern. It's a check shirt. shirt. Now, where more? So look, so essentially say a pixelated image or, or say a chessboard pattern or the kind of shirt he is wearing or um, uh, any of these are essentially places where you have a very high texture composition. So there are alternating rows and columns of uh, highs and lows which are coming down over there. Now in natural images, it's, it's very regular to have these kind of textured regions. So a simple example is that you have a green ball lying on a green field or, or on grass. 
Okay. Now, how do you discriminate between the ball and the grass? Just based on color, you will never be able to do because both of them are green. The only way you will be able to do that is if you look into the textures over there because the rate at which spatially the uh, say the, the color of green, the shades of green will be changing for grass is very different from the rate at which it will be changing for the ball. Right? So they are those cases where these become very powerful. Now the, the good thing with all of this was that it however learns essentially that these smaller kind of attributes are also very important in order to uh, uh, discriminate a scene uh, discriminate different objects present in a scene. You will be able to classify only if you are able to discriminate all objects which are present over there. Other than that you will not be able to do. Now you need to have feature descriptors which are well good enough to discriminate between these different kind of objects which are present in a scene. Otherwise it's not able to do that. Now these networks by virtue of being able to learn from the data itself could pick up these kind of new patterns which earlier nobody had actually thought of. Then on top of it is color gradients, which is also not something usual. Like as, as standard computer vision designers, we never think of using uh, these kind of color gradients as some of these standard features in order to build a pipeline for uh, visual inferencing. So now, if you look through this, what happens over here is, say I have this image of a car, which is uh, 3 cross 2, 2, 4 cross 2, 2, 4, which goes into this network as an input. Okay, so you will have some convolutions over here and this is the result of those convolutions and in the first few layers you will still be able to see something about the shape of a car. In the first layer typically you will be able to see something which is like the border of a car over there. Okay, but the moment you do this ReLU you will be losing out all your negative components. Anything which is less than zero becomes zero and as a result of that you will be having only very high responses, very high positive responses only going pass through it and others don't. Now as you keep on going towards the last layer, you would see that it boils down to just bitwise responses. Some particular channel will have high as in over here, other uh, this might have some high and others become low. And those kind of 0, 1, 0, 1 kind of patterns over there are essentially what starts building your total inference logic over here. So how do you infer uh, through this whole network of computation as to which one is going to be the class to which this object belongs to. And that's how you get down your final one which says that this is high and essentially this is for the car. So it has a higher probability of looking at a car. Now initially when you start training your network you will have all random weights and then it would keep on increasing. Now in the uh, hands-on tutorials which we had done you had uh, found out what is the total size of the weight matrix and then you had trained it out but we have not yet visualized the weights part of it. So this is something which we will have to do. But then that's not hard because you already know how to find a weight after training or, or once a model is there, you had pulled out that weight location over there using parameters. Now what you have is you will get down that parameter as some sort of an array. You will have to just resize or reshape whatever you are doing it into a 2D matrix over there. Okay. Next what is needed is you need to understand that uh, if it's a RGB image, then uh, if you're looking at the first layer over there, then the first layer kernel we can also be a three channel one and you can directly visualize it in color. But the point is that output of the first layer which goes to the second layer. So the first layer for an AlexNet has 96 channels. Output of the first layer has 96 channels, yes or no? Yes, there are 96 kernels in total, okay? So this 96 channels are going as input to the next layer which also has uh, how many? So this one has uh, 256 over there. So there will be 256 such kernels, <coughs> each of size 96 cross 5 cross 5. And this is where the challenge now comes. Now how do you visualize a 96 channel 5 cross 5 thing? A 3 channel one is okay, you have RGB. A 96 channel one, how do you visualize? Now in that case, now you will have to play the trick over there. So what we generally do in that case is you visualize each channel at a time. So there will be 96 such channels of 5 cross 5 size and this is what corresponds to one single kernel itself. And then you will have to do this for all, all the 256 kernels coming down over there. So this is how you keep on doing and visualizing and eventually when you open up and start visualizing you can actually start looking at mappings like what it was learning, how it was learning. 
Okay. Now beyond that, I will at a later on point uh, uh, in a mature stage after your midterm exams and stuff, we will also be getting into explaining you something which is called as a system response explainers for neural networks, and they are all black box level. Exp uh, they are all white box explainers. So they they will tell you essentially how was this uh, synthesizing the logic as it went across the depth. Because if you are looking at one channel at a time or one uh, not one channel, one convolution kernel for a given layer, one layer by layer if you are looking at it. Now you tend to uh, not get the relation what is happening across the depth of the layers over there. Now that's something which we will be doing when we get into the total uh, white boxed explanations using system explainers. So what that would do is that would, that would exactly show you that a combination of these kernels with successive convolutions at the end of it can be reversed and it will give you a very uh, probable look of what is a car, of what is a cow, what is a dog. And they are interesting from the fact that if you train a network, you don't exactly know what was it actually synthesizing in its mind or what was it dreaming about when you tell that there is a cow. But then if I want to really get that one output over there, that if I say that this is the class of a cow, then what do you mean by a class of a cow? This is the same as that when you are a kid, you are initially taught with pictures or you look at objects and you make it up and then comes down your drawing class. In drawing class, you have to draw a cow. Now, nobody teaches you exactly to draw a cow. You were taught how to write alphabets because they are not natural. But then drawing a cow is something which you do by yourself. So initially you will start by drawing trees, which are easiest to do, and then you come to cows and everything over there. But then how do you draw? You basically look at something, you make an impression and you draw. After some time you will not be having that reference in front of you as well and you can just draw it from your mind. So there is something you always have in your mind to do it. So similarly, these neural networks also have a common minimal representation of all of these objects present over there. So and, and there are ways, but these are very recent things. I mean, this is what I'm telling you is 2019 itself. So in 2019, we did get some mechanisms by which now you can open up the neural network and look into what it had actually learned. So then comes this next one, which is called as VGGNet. And by far, this is, uh, this is what you can call as the uh, King Kong of all neural networks. This is the biggest, bulkiest, and computationally most expensive network ever built. So in fact, this is used for stress testing of hardware systems which are designed for doing deep learning. So if you can learn, if you can infer from a VGG net without crashing or within a human real time, then you have qualified the test. So any other deep neural network for vision inference which we have today has a compute complexity and a space complexity which is significantly lower than this. This is sort of the upper bound on architectures which humans have created. And then we did realize that it does not really make sense to have that bulky network. So today's networks are typically something like one tenth to one hundredth of the compute complexity and model size of a standard VGG net. Okay. But then this came down from, uh, so th this was with uh, Zizerman's group at Oxford and uh, VGG is basically visual geometry group. So that's Andrew Zizerman research group at Oxford and when they came up with this network, he just named it after uh, his lab. Now. I don't exactly know whether he named it after his lab or whether people started calling it <laughs> with that because essentially the paper title reads as very deep convolutional networks for large scale image recognition and nothing beyond it. Okay. Now uh, here the idea was something which was inspired from what is called as a multi-scale processing uh, within standard vision inference. So multi-scale processing has a point where if you look at an image, you can either look very close by or you can look very far off and get a bird's eye view. Okay, so essentially you are changing what is your resolution within the locality at which you are looking. So if you are looking at a thing from very close, you don't see things which are very far off, but you see only that particular thing in a very high granular details. When you are looking from very far off, you don't see granular details over there, but now you are able to see the complete area coverage which is coming over there. Now what that would mean is that images can now be broken down into a pyramidal structure. So you can keep on going smaller and smaller. Now, as you are going to a smaller sized image, now look into it. You are going to lose down on the detailing. So this detailing has to be kept somewhere. So typically what we do in a multi-resolution processing is that you have uh, two directions, uh, X direction and a Y direction. 
Now along the x direction you can keep on doing a subsampling, so which is essentially that every alternate column you drop it out. Along the y direction also you can do a subsampling, which is every alternate row you keep on dropping it down. Okay. Now if you drop every alternate row and every alternate column on an image, then obviously it's going to become one fourth of the size of the original image, right? But then you are losing out on some of these high frequency components over there. This, this extra thing which you will need to be added over there. So those can also be pulled out and kept separately. However, here the idea was that we will be successively breaking it down into smaller, smaller sizes. And now what this guy does is you start with an image canvas of size 3 cross 2 to 4 cross 2 to 4. Now here, this was before the standard conventions came into place. So you would have the channel dimension written down at the last index over here. But remember that this, this last index is not the y size, but this is the channel index over there. Okay. So now the first one is a three channel of uh, spatial span 2 to 4 cross 2 to 4. Now from there, it goes on to uh, a convolution layer where there are two successive convolution layers and then they retain the size of this one. So we'll come into the architecture detail, but it retains the size of it and there are 64 such. So this one is 64, this is 264. So there is, there is a battery of convolutions which go down. Now once that happens, then you have this in this red block, what is called as the max pooling layer. So you do a two cross two max pooling with a stride of two, two by two. As a result, your size will decrease from two to four cross two to four to one one two cross one one two. Okay. Now once you do this here, you are going to have uh, 128 convolution kernels over there. So as a result of it, the channel size increases over there. So this is why you will see that as it keeps on reducing its size, you have this thickening also happening over here. Okay. So it will keep on fattening, it will reduce its spatial span and it will keep on becoming fatter and fatter and it goes down towards this last point where it becomes a 7 cross 7 cross 512. Okay, now these neurons are now linearized and fully connected to another pipeline of 1 cross 1 cross 4096. Okay, now this will be an interesting thing to observe that if you convolve with a 7 cross 7 kernel, it's the same as trying to linearize and get down a fully connected network itself. And that's essentially what is done over here. And, and then if you run these kind of one cross one convolutions, say one cross one convolutions of uh, 4096. So that's essentially mapping down all 4096, one cross ones over here to all 4096, one cross ones in the next one. Okay, so you can pretty much derive this one out. In fact, this will be an interesting derivation which we will do sometime ahead. Uh, as, as one of the exercises where you will have to prove that a uh, piped convolution, which is a one cross one convolution, is the same, has the same mathematical operation as in a fully connected network itself. Okay. Now, as a result of this, there are a lot of things which get saved. The moment you can define a piped convolution, you can now, instead of uh, computing anything as a fully connected network, you can actually have these convolutions connected. So your a combination of a convolution network plus a fully connected network, which we had seen at a LeNet, can now be brought down as a whole combination of convolutional network itself, and you don't have anything else going on. Now, how this network looks like, this would be hard from the last rows to see, so I will, I will just read it out. Now, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different combinations which they had proposed, and each had a different uh, depth. Depth as in how many layers are present over there. Okay. Now, and, and they group it down based on at what particular resolution you are operating a certain layer. So there was this A, which had 11 uh, layers in total. 11 layers mean 11 computational layers, not the subsampling layer. So your max pooling is not an effective layer over there. Okay. But, but you have weights which are present in 11 layers. The next one was also in 11 layer with a important thing which is called as local response normalization brought into after the first battery. Then you had 13 layer, 16 layer, and then eventually the bulkiest one is what has 19 layers. Now how they do is, is quite uh, intuitive. So you have a set of battery of convolutions such that the total number of fully connected layers at the end is the same. Now that can be brought down to the same and, and also with the same number of connections if the output of the convolution at this last layer, which is one, two, three, four, five, output at the fifth battery, which if you look over here, you have first battery of convolution, second battery of convolution, third battery of convolution, fourth battery, fifth battery. So if the output of the fifth battery, irrespective of how many convolution layers I squeeze in between, is the same, 
then obviously this last part remains the same. Okay. Now here they start by doing this something like this. In the first battery of convolution, you have a three cross three convolution with a padding of one and a stride of one and 64 such convolutions. One. Now, if you do a uh, convolution with a three cross three kernel and a pad of one and a stride of one, what will be the output? So your input is uh, two to four, uh, three cross two to four cross two to four and you have a three cross three convolution with a stride of one, pad of one, and uh, 64 such convolution kernels. So can you tell me what is the out, what is the size of the tensor, which is as a result of output from the first convolution layer in VGG 11? So just, just derive and tell me. 64. 2 to 4 cross 2 to 4 cross 64 cross 2 to 4 cross 2 to 4, right? So from here, uh, there is a max pooling, which is of 2 cross 2 and with a side of 2 comma 2. Is it clear to the other people as well how we derived, got to that point? Just don't nod your head. I mean, is it clear or isn't it clear? How we derived? Yes, no, some responses, my dear. No. Yes, that's what he wanted. <laughs> so, you remember that when we were convolving, based on what is the size of the kernel, what is the stride, how much was the padding, we were deriving what will be the size of the output, which is the spatial span of the output. The number of channels in output anyways is related to the total number of convolution kernels present over there. So since there were 64 convolution kernels, so my output will have 64 channels present over there. That's clear. Now the other point which is remaining is that what will be the spatial span. Okay. So my input is 2 to 4. Now how was my span derived over that? M, if that is the total number of columns or the width of an image, and W is the width of my convolution kernel, then it was M minus W. And if you are padding with PW on both the sides of it, then plus 2PW, this is the total span on which I can move, divided by SW, which was the stride in which I am moving. But this would cover from the first location to the last but one location. I also have something which comes down on the last location, which is plus one. So essentially the concept was the same as count all um, integers in the range of 1 to 4. The number of integers in the range of 1 to 4 is 1, 2, 3, 4. Not 3, but 4 numbers over there. Okay, so 4 minus 1 is going to give you 3, but that is not the total number of integers. You have a plus 1 to be done over there. So that's the same logic in which it goes, and you are able to derive what is that output over there. Now you do a con uh, max pooling with a 2 cross 2 and a side of 2 cross 2, so this will drop it down to a tensor of size. So input to the second convolution will be of what size? Output of the first convolution layer is 64 cross 2 to 4 cross 2 to 4. Then you have a max pooling operation with a 2 cross 2 and a stride of 2 cross 2. So what will be the input to the second convolution layer? 64 cross 112 cross 112. So you are doing a 2 by 2 max pooling over there. So it, it just affects your spatial span, but it does not affect the total number of channels. Now here, you do a convolution in the same way, 3 cross 3 with a stride of 1 and a pad of 1. So essentially that's, that's going to give you again the same as, uh, and there are 124, 128 kernels. So this is going to give you 128 cross 112 cross 112. Then you do a max pooling and then you drop it down. Now here when it comes, you have 256 kernels, but see, that the first one will get an input which is um, 112 divided by 2 is 51, 56. So here it gets down uh, 56 cross, uh, sorry, um, 128 cross 56 cross 56 as an input over here. There are one, 256 such kernels. Now that's going to go over here and the input to this, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, the fourth convolution layer for series A is going to be of what size? 256 cross 56 cross 56 over that and so on and so forth and you keep on deriving. Now, yes. So see over here it became 64 cross 112 cross 112. You had a max pooling over there. So that made it 56 cross 56. Wait, uh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Here, it output of this first convolution layer is 64 cross 224 cross 224. That went into make max pooling, which made it 64 cross 112 cross 112. 
that went into this next convolution which made it 128 cross 112 cross 112 this 3 cross 3 convolution over here yes because I had 128 convolution kernels in the first one I had 64 convolution kernels next I had 128 convolution kernels so obviously the number of channels is increasing over there and you keep on doing now when you want to increase the depth the idea was that you don't jeopardize the total uh, resolutions over there the spatial resolutions and uh, in order to keep that normal you would be inserting convolution kernels in between these batteries now what this ensured was that your output to the uh, this, this uh, first fully connected layer would always be of the same tensor size so this makes it a very modular way of increasing the depths over there so if you go from here uh, I'll get back to local response normalization in just a minute so now if you do all of this you will be able to find out what is your total number of parameters now in your in case of your total number of parameters what it was found out is that for a there were 133 million parameters so that's mil in, in millions essentially and uh, f which was a 11 layer network over here when we went from an 11 layer network to a 19 layer network it increased to 144 million parameters now this is not a small number in any way 144 million parameters per single image which you will have to learn which has just 224 cross 224 pixels if you take all the three color channels then it has 3 cross 224 cross 224 now what is this number 3 into 224 into 224 uh, how how what is the value something but then from an image which has just 120,000 independent points you will have to learn 144 parameters so is that a complete problem or is this an ill post problem what do you think my input matrix just has 120,000 uh, points given down over there values for which I can construct some equations now what is the total number of unique equations which I can construct over there? 1,20,000 for 1,20,000 points I can have 1,20,000 unique equations that's it okay how many parameters do I have over here? yes so now we will come to that point so essentially now I will need to define a unique set of equations such that 144 million parameters can be solved which means that there should be 144 unique equations in order to solve it out okay now can you uh, and uh, now comes the other part of it the other part is that because this is convolutional so essentially I am not able to define 120,000 different equations so if that was a fully connected I would have said that I have 120,000 different equations because over here you have a mixing of parameters which is going across all of them so essentially what I am able to define through this network for one single image is, is just one set of equation one set of equation which has one uh, 144 million parameters now if that's the situation and I will have to define 144 million equations in order to get it so that would mean that my data set should have 144 million images itself okay so what is the size of image net is the next question which also which includes your test set validation set and the training set your training set is typically a 10 million images data set over there so now what do you do <laughs> so two things which came out of this one was one understanding this these networks are over parameterized and as a result of this over parameterization you have a lot of redundancy coming down over there so essentially what will happen to a set of equations is that if you have less number of uh, unique equations defined for a set of variables over there then most of these variables will get, get mapped onto a similar kind of a value so there would obviously be a redundancy which is good from a systems perspective but bad from a computation perspective because you are uselessly computing more then you know that by doing down on the reduced set also you should be able to do it so that's something I will come back a bit later on again like like how do you really get to know how reduced can networks itself be so one of these ones over here in this a had something which is called as a LRN 
called as local response normalization, which is present in the first layer itself. And beyond that, you don't see this one. Now, uh, the whole idea for local response normalization was something like this, that because I have a stack of channels, okay. Now, output of my first layer was 64 stack of channels. Now, across these 64, at any given pixel location, which is this x comma y, at a given location x comma y and the channel location i, the idea was that locally within a particular span, which span is given over here. So there is a n by 2 span across present over there. So across a n by 2, n by 2, which is n number of channels, small n number of channels spanning along this um, i, where i is at the center of that pipe. So assume that this to be a pipe, that you have some sort of a normalization going on locally as well, but this is across channels. And this was done to keep uh, the output of your first layer, you don't even have a ReLU or any transfer function over here. So you don't have a way by which you are imposing bounds of some sort. So this was done so that you have locally some sort of a bound <coughs> imposed over there. And if you look into this whole set of equation, then intuitively it comes down that your A over here will, uh, uh, this B over here will be a bound, will be bounded in the range of zero to one. It may really reach the highest value of one as well, but in general it will be bounded in the range of zero to one. And also you will be, uh, the, uh, and, and if there are negative values, then also it will, so, so essentially like its magnitude is bounded zero to one. So the whole range in which the values can vary is from minus one to plus one. This is what happens over here by way of this. However, it was realized that this whole form has one issue, which is this uh, two values, k and alpha, uh, as well as uh, this beta, k, alpha, and beta, these three values, which need to be learnt as well. And that introduces additional parameters, as well as makes this system uh, very cumbersome to compute itself. As you have this squaring operation, then a summation, and then this raised to the power of beta. A number raised to a certain power itself is a polynomial complexity solver. And then again, a division operation, so over there. So this was the reason why this was, uh, uh, sort of uh, neglected in, in future releases. And uh, today we don't make use of LRNs other than there being a very specific case where local response normalization necessarily needs to be taken care of. Now this is uh, about the performances, what it had. So essentially uh, because it was looking at multiple classes and then uh, ImageNet is something where you have uh, one million classes of objects defined over there. Uh, there are different ones. There is one with 1,000 classes. There is one with 10,000 classes. There is one with a million classes over there. Now, for each of them, you are just, one way would be you look, you define accuracy as something like if on the highest prediction, whether that matches with my class. But then that sometimes becomes hard because you have classes which are sort of overlapping. So there can be a duck, quail, birds, eagles, all of this. Now the point is that a duck is also a bird, a quail is also a bird, a quail is also a duck, and uh, an eagle is also a bird. So any of these predictions which comes on the top few, you should more or less be able to say that it's, it's okay. So there was this other metric which was called as a top five validation. So within the top five of the predictions, whether your, pre your actual class category to which this object has been labeled is present or not. Now, based on this, uh, there were these issues because a certain object can belong to multiple categories as well. Now based on who was labeling it and uh, that that whole thing was present over there. So eventually later on we got another interesting data set called as MS Coco, uh, common objects in common context. So uh, that was from Microsoft and what they did is that for every single object which can belong to multiple classes, it was annotated for all the classes itself. So it was no more a one hot encoding but a multi hot encoding which made this learning process much more, much better and much uh, lively itself. Okay. The next one is, uh, what was by Google and uh, if you look at the last part of it, it's Linet. So in fact, uh, how it came was um, Google basically uh, hired uh, Jan Lekan for some bigger roles and uh, he now had the whole uh, Google AI labs <coughs> which he was leading. And here the idea was that this more or less looks almost like a Linet and it gets in some of these features from a VGG itself, okay. So in VGG you had different resolutions in which you had a battery of convolutions which was operating. Now here also he brought in the same thing. So this whole point is a battery of convolution. This whole point is a battery of convolution. And this whole point is another battery of convolution. 
over there. Now what he does typically is that in each battery you can have series serial convolutions as well as you have some which are parallel and this was a property borrowed down from AlexNet itself. The only difference was in this parallel nodes, so let me come over here. So this one thing which you are seeing over here is called as an inception module which is essentially this uh, smaller part over here, this, this some things in parallel and serial. Now what this consists of is something like this that from the previous layer you might get down a bunch of these parallel lined up filters, you basically concatenate all of them and get down a tensor of multiple channels. Now this comes over here, goes through, so, so uh, sorry, the lower part is, is from where you get the input from the previous layer. Now it goes through a one cross one convolution and produces some output, okay. It goes through one cross one convolution, then three cross three convolution, then produces an output. It goes through a one cross one convolution, then five cross five convolution, then produces an output. Three cross three max pooling, which is it reduces the size, then goes through one cross one convolution and then produces the output. So essentially this was a dense on this one, this was a uh, sort of sparse or, or made down on the low frequency side of it and a one cross one convolution and these one cross one convolutions are basically mixing across all the channels, whatever is happening. Next in these two, you are mixing across the channels and then learning certain features by doing a one cross one and a three cross three. So there was a different depth aspect involved over here, different resolution aspect involved over here and together when you get all the outputs, you concatenate and bring it to the same uh, kind of spatial size and all the channels together over there. So uh, I will share across the whole detail, uh, detail diagram of this one or, or you can google it up. So because we will have the slides shared as well, so you, you need to basically zoom in and see. Once you zoom in and see, you will be able to read through how many channels are present, how many convolution kernels, what are the size of the convolution kernels and each of them over there. So here they, they had drawn down this, this total number of uh, parameters which was present in this whole network. So essentially across each of them they found out uh, what is the total number of parameters involved and then they also found out what is the total number of operations or mathematical operations in terms of multiplication, additions, whatever is happening over there. Okay. So this kind of a table is what we are going to do but we will be doing it as a worksheet on Wednesday. So I will have to first help you derive. So first in the first part of the class we will derive exactly how to come to the number of operations involved with a certain uh, number of operations involved with a certain kind of a processing which goes down. So whether it's convolution or it's fully connected or it's uh, some sort of a response normalization, it's a non-linear like a ReLU or, or it can be something like a softmax where you need to find out what is the max value, mean value. Then then how do you do that or, or maybe it's a regularization of some sort. So on, on this uh, point of Google Net how it performed, now essentially when it went on to this top 5 and the error rate started reducing significantly over here. Now this was not just by virtue of this whole network. There was also an interesting thing, if you look into these kind of small hexa uh, the octagonal blocks over here, these blocks are essentially something which is associated with what is called as a gradient injection. The whole idea was the deeper a network is, you know that it's going to get multiplied by the weights and keep on the gradient gets multiplied by the weight. As a result of that if your, gra if your gradient is 0 to 1, your weights are also 0 to 1, you will see that your effective gradients as it comes to the shallower layers is a very low number. It's so low that, that it rarely impacts anything on the weights over there. So these small gradient injections over here will help you really pump up the total gradient. So this is almost like uh, in your water supply lines, you would see that the city has a water supply line, it pumps up from a reservoir but then suddenly the pressure would go down. So in between they would have something which is called as a booster station. A booster station is it pumps in some additional water from the groundwater level and then recharges or, or they have these higher up tanks in which water is filled up for uh, throughout the day and in this two hours of a supply pipeline they will just release that water itself. So together it creates huge amount of pressure such that the water can actually go to the tanks of your household otherwise it can just fill up a small pond and it will not do. So it's the same kind of a concept which happens over here and then it's interesting to look into it if you uh, look that dynamics of point systems which you had studied in engineering mechanics in your first year. A lot of those understanding of dynamics is what guides how these uh, convergence of errors would come down because that is also a point on a convex surface which almost mimics uh, what your rolling ball on a convex surface in case of a mechanics class looks like. So from here 
Let's get into this other network, which is called as a REST net or, or a residual network. Now, this is uh, much more recent, I would say, from 2016. And uh, there were multiple networks which also came in the between, but, but we are doing uh, over a selective ones of which have really left an impression or which is significantly popular in what we are doing. Now, here the idea was that you don't, uh, you can still be scaling down resolutions and everything, but uh, one point was that you are not able to have the same input propagated through the depth of the network. Okay, now the ability to propagate inputs through the depth of the network would mean that anything which may get lost if you are successively convolving is not lost anymore. So it's, it's propagating throughout. So there can be small subtle structures and you would like to pre uh, keep them till the end of. So essentially a residual block is something which looks like this that you have an input, you do a series of convolution, then a relu, then convolution, max pooling. Then what you are going to do is you are going to add all of these together. It's an actual addition, not a concatenation. It's an addition and then you have your output which is generated. Okay. Now there were different, uh, so the original paper had uh, the batch norm which was placed over here. These greens are batch norms. Uh, the, there was another alternate one which was proposed that the batch norm be placed after the addition. And then uh, without a relu is something which looks like this. So these are just different types of implementations which are put down over there. Now with ResNet, for the first time it was shown that in the earlier cases you would see that, uh, so there are these uh, standard ones. So this is basically where you don't have a residual connection. And uh, this is where you have a residual connection. Now typically you would see that uh, earlier it was hard for a deeper network to have a, so what we are showing is that the red one is a deeper network which has more number of layers. The cyan one is not a deeper network, it's a shallow one network. So red has 34 layers, shall, uh, cyan has 18 layers. Now the idea over here is that the deeper you keep on going, the lower should be your error in prediction. That's what should happen. However, it was observed that that was not what was happening. Now, how did this have this kind of a curve? We'll, we'll get into your hot restart and cold restart conditions in, in learning when you will see that your curves will also start becoming like this. There will no more be a this kind, but it will go hit a saturation. Then we will make some changes onto the learning parameters. You will again see it coming and dropping down. So here, this was not getting observed. So essentially you were still seeing that a deeper network was having a more error than a shallower network. And for a rest net for the first time, we did start seeing that one, that a deeper network started having lesser errors than a shallower network and that was by virtue of being able to transport whatever was in a low resolution, in, in a very high resolution thing on the earlier layers to the end layer itself. Okay. So this was the calculation for their total number of parameters and uh, compute operations. We'll get into detailing for each of them as well. And then came this interesting chap in 2017 called as DenseNet and what it was doing is that instead of having connections just bypassing every block, you basically do long order connections as well. So it's, it's almost like an interconnected highway kind of a thing. So from the first layer, you can have a direct one to the last layer. You can have it going to any of these intermediate layers as well. And this one could beat ResNet as in over here by significant factors by showing that even for lesser number of parameters, you were able to gain similar kind of accuracies and a deeper network as well. And you had less number of parameters because, because you were directly doing those passing of information. So your uh, total convolution number of channels did not need to get thickened. So they were much thinner. So over here you would see that, that uh, the total number of convolutions would be something in the order of about 6 or 12 or 24 or 16, these kind of things. So the total number of channels got reduced. As a result of it, the total number of parameters get reduced. But you can go deeper and deeper as well as you have a higher accuracy with lower number of parameters. So this was one and very interesting finding which came out with dense nets and that actually showed that we were not really clever till before this one in order to define it. We were defining more parameters, did not necessarily mean that we were deeper and did not necessarily mean that we were uh, really harnessing all the information over there. So that's where we come to an end for this architecture and this is more or less major architectures which we will be doing through the rest of this class itself. Now first what we will start with on Wednesday is uh, showing you how to derive your total number of flops and everything. There was an earlier one uh, during convolutions, uh, I think it was two or three class earlier but where I had derived out the total number of parameters, how to calculate parameters. So please revise that parameter calculation before you come for the Wednesday class 
And Wednesday class, I'm going to show you how to derive number of computations, and there will be a worksheet given to do that as well. So please uh, advise your remaining friends who are not in class today to also come on the Wednesday class.